17th of November 1922. Four young lads, again from the Liberties, possibly new, Joseph Spooner. Um, they were executed in Kilmainham. And a short time later, we have Erskine Childers executed in Burgess Bush. And then six days later, we have the execution of the three men we're here to remember today. Um, the reason that you have, as I said, those executions, Oriel House was a place where the Murder Gang was operating from. That and Wellington Barracks. Um, they were synonymous places with torture, um, with brutal treatment, and men who were connected with events like the Red Cow um, and the murder of Colin Colley were connected to Oriel House. And it comes up in for specific targeting by the anti-treaty IRA. Right? And the night that you have the attack on Oriel House, which was the 30th of October, four men were arrested in the vicinity after that attack happened. Mines had been placed in and around Oriel House. One mine went off. Um, it's all in the newspapers. Um, you have four men arrested, and as Rowan said, we have three mentions here, but the other man, young man, was um, James Mallon, the son of Michael Mallon, executed in 1916 leader. The thing is, you look at the raid books that are in military archives, and these were books that were entered or entered upon in every night that raids were carried out by military intelligence coming from um, Wellington Barracks, coming from Portobello Barracks. And after the three or the four are arrested, they went to the houses. And one after the other, you see them come to the house of Joseph Spooner. And they say, raided after person was arrested, nothing found. And then you see Patrick Farrelly's address, and then you see John Morphy's address. So nothing is found in the premises. However, they were involved in this attack on Oriel House. But it's the nature of the executions. Who was chosen to be executed? This is what causes, I suppose, one of the many problems we have with events that happen in the Civil War. There's so much secrecy around it. And on the morning of the 30th of November, after they had been put on trial and found guilty, we have the executions taking place of Spooner, Farrelly and Murphy. Now, I'm paraphrasing Richard Mulcahy because there was obviously um, questions being raised as to the executions that were taking place, as to the way the war was developing and also to the increase in, in murders and stuff that was happening. And Richard Mulcahy, for, as I said, I'm paraphrasing, he state, said that those soldiers, Free State soldiers, National Army soldiers that were killed in ambushes, they never got to say goodbye to their families, they never got to write last letters. Um, but those who were executed under the power of the military courts, they never got to see their families either. The only one I do know of is Erskine Childers who got to see his son. They got to write their last letters to their families, but they were given to their families after they had died. And their families, in most cases, found out that their loved one was executed, sometimes by a dispatch writer, but more often than not, by the daily newspapers. And that was in the case of Peter Cassidy and in the case um, of some of these here. Now, the executions, there was not a blanket support for the policy. And you did have politicians that raised questions in the doll. And I want to read excerpts of one such member of the, uh, the doll who did raise questions about what was going on and the legitimacy of the trials, how this was being carried out, who was being chosen and why they were being chosen. And I suppose it's fitting where we are today, we're in the shadow of the former Labour court, that it was Thomas Johnson, the Labour leader. So if you just bear with me, but on the 30th of November, so the day the executions happened, he raised his distance at all. And what he said, I feel it very difficult to deal with this question of executions again, but it is a duty that we must raise a question like this, because we believe it is the need of this community that this method of carrying out punishment ought not to be persisted in. We read in the evening papers that three persons, presumably, presumably men, have been executed this morning. The particulars are slightly fuller than in the case of the four men executed last week, and that would be the four that were shot in Kilmainham, but only slightly. I say men, I do not know whether they were men. The age is not given, and as it turns out, they were all under the age, or they were 21 or younger. 
Um, I am not going to deal with the crime for which he has been executed, but I'm going to deal with the method of the trial, the method of the sentences, and the method of the announcement to the public of the trial and the sentences. We've been told pretty frequently during the last few weeks that it is the intention of the Ministry to re-establish the reign of law, and we were told yesterday, as we've been told frequently, that unless this kind of thing is done, anarchy will prevail. I want to make the charge that this kind of trial, this kind of sentence, is in fact anarchy. It is not law. It is anarchy, lynch law once removed. Men are found with bombs and revolvers in the streets. They are arrested by the military authority. They are taken prisoners by the military authority. They remain in possession of the military authority. They are tried by the military authority and they are executed by the military authority. And the announcement of their executions is made by the military authority in a form and manner designed by the military authority and no public person outside that authority knows anything about it. The people against whom the offence is primarily committed, the people who make the arrests, the people who make the trial, the people who carry out the sentences are the same people. There have now been eight men executed in Dublin. We are assured that this is not out of vengeance that these men have been executed, but as a deterrent, as an example to the remainder. It is due to us to know on what principle the selection is being made. We were assured last night that no difference was made between officers and men. Is there any difference being made between officer and officer? Is there any difference being made as between man and man? Is there any difference being made as between locality and locality? How does that happen if these executions are as deterrents that all those which have taken place so far have taken place in Dublin only? Is the method of selection choice or chance? Is it by law? Is it by the enormity of the crime? Is it by the circumstances surrounding the crime? Has the locality, has the composition of the court anything to do with the selection of the men that are doomed to execution? I am pleading in the interest of justice, in the interest of good government, in the interest of the future of this country, that trials for this offence, for the capital offence, for any capital offence, for any offence whatever, but particularly trials for the capital offence, must not be in secret. And the facts of the case, the circumstances surrounding the case, must be made public. We are asked to hand over absolute trust in the military court. In no country anywhere at any time dare the public of that country hand over to any military authority absolute trust to do justice. I express the fear when these courts are being authorised that sentences might be carried out by the people against whom the crime was being committed and that the trials might take place when men were in hot blood. I am happy to say that there is no evidence before us of anything like that having happened. There is not evidence before us, but the secrecy which is exemplified in this kind of thing may suggest that there is secrecy elsewhere. And the demand for publicity is a demand that every civilian in the country who has any regard for the rule of law ought to insist upon. Everyone of the, uh, every one of the cases may have been proved right to the hilt. We have only to take the word of the officers of the court that they were proved. It is not my desire to wallow in morbid details, it is the desire to have some public check upon courts which is not even the experience of courts of law. But even though they had that, public check is necessary. The plea of military necessity does not avail, civil necessity is just as great and it is on civil necessity that men are being tried for their lives. Their fellow citizens should know the grounds of their trial. Their fellow citizens should know the evidence on which they are being convicted. Their fellow citizens should know the defence that is being made on their behalf. Presumably, they are innocent until they are found guilty. And it is our duty to defend the liberty of these subjects, or the liberty of these citizens, as I prefer to call them. The rule of law which is desired in this country must depend upon the backing of the public mind, the public conscience, and that must be an intelligent public conscience. You cannot have an intelligent public conscience unless you have an informed public conscience. And you cannot have an informed public conscience uh, sorry, while you have this secrecy. I appeal with all the energy and effort that I am capable of to ask the Ministry to change the decision in regard to this secrecy. Here are men guilty of preparing to take the lives of citizens, to take the lives of soldiers, and incidentally, to take the lives of citizens. Surely that is a case that ought to be tried in public. Surely, if you have any confidence that the public is with you, that it is a case that ought, that ought to be tried in public. Secrecy suggests fear, and fear leads to brutality and barbarity. And that last sentence, fear leads to brutality and barbarity, 
they are very prophetic because within the next six months, over 70 more men were to be executed at the hands or on the orders of these courts. And that is not to mention the countless numbers of young men who were killed in custody, who were killed trying to escape. And like Rich Mulcahy said, there were no last letters, there was no last meeting with the families. And the families have been lost in all of this. Um, Joseph Spooner's mother saw him in what's now Griffith Barracks, it was Wellington Barracks, thinking that, oh, he would be put in prison. No one thought that these three young men would be executed here. They would be followed by another in 1923, as had we had with Erskine Childers just a week before. The grief for the parents, for the brothers, for the sisters, for the families of those men, it was compounded because, unlike those who had sons that were killed in the National Army, their bodies weren't given back. As it says on this plaque, it was a further two years in October 1924, so literally shy of a month to the anniversary of the executions, that the bodies were handed back, that the families could not say get any measure of closure, if they got any measure of closure, have they gotten any measure of closure, even a hundred years on? That is a question I cannot answer. However, I think events like this are so important. We know that there are so many unanswered questions relating to events like this because the documents were destroyed officially on the orders of the outgoing Cosgrave government in 1932 before Fianna Fáil got in to prevent the future loss of life, anything to do with policy execution, so documents were to be destroyed. Hence, there are no trial records for the trials of Spooner, Farrelly or uh, Murphy and the countless others. There are no transcripts of those who were, or in inquests were held, or those who were interrogated in custody. A hundred years on, as I said, I don't think there is closure for the families because there are so many unanswered questions. But events like this, when we have plaques like this, at least it acknowledges that events like this happened in our communities up and down this country. It is a talking point. There will be people that come through here that will see this plaque, that will ask questions. Who were these people? Who is Joseph Spooner? It will get conversation going. And hopefully, as Rowan said, none of us can understand, none of us can imagine what it was like to live at that time. But with the decade of centenaries, the decade of commemorations, it has given us an opportunity to try and understand what it was like back then. What made a young man, what made a young woman who had her whole lives ahead of them make a decision to sacrifice their lives for the future of their country? They sacrificed their future for the future of others. So I am so honoured to be asked to speak at this event today. Um, I really do hope that more plaques like this um, do appear over the coming years. And I would really like to say a huge, huge thank you to Jim, who I know many, many years, who was the driving force behind this, um, that finally this plaque is here to remember Joseph Spooner and his comrades who were executed 100 years ago today.